Hello and welcome to North Country Matters. My name is Donna Seymour. I'm a member of the St. Lawrence County branch of the American Association of University Women, one of the civic partners for this show. Today we have a conversation with Pat Brady, the superintendent of Potsdam Central, and Bill Gregory, the superintendent of Canton Central. Joining us is Ann Carvel, an education blogger and a former Potsdam Board of Education member. Welcome to North Country Matters, Thank gentlemen. You. Pat, Thanks, you Sam. have been here with us uh, a number of times. Bill, this is your first time, so uh, we're very happy to have you here. You both have been on a, I think we could describe it as a rigorous uh, schedule to put information in front of the voters in both districts about the proposed merger between Canton Central and Potsdam Central. Uh, the end is nearly in sight with the uh, straw vote next week, so we hope that this uh, segment of North Country Matters will help to uh, continue to educate the public. We're going to give you just a little bit of background, a few facts to set the stage. Following a lengthy study, consultants from Western New York Education Council in Buffalo concluded that merging the two districts would, number one, save money, and number two, improve the educational opportunities for students. So let's take a moment and look at the projected numbers. During the past few years, Canton and Potsdam have both had to cut staffing, some major cuts, uh, cut programs, you've had to dip into your reserve funds, and just to meet operational uh, expenses. With a merger, both districts are projected to be able to um, save some money and stave off insolvency, which of course is very important as, <laughs> as you both know. Uh, a new combined merger, a uh, new combined district, if the merger occurs, would gain an extra $35 million in state incentive aid over 14 years. Uh, you'd receive $3.5 million in each of the first five years, which would decrease by 4% for the next nine years after that. And it would be able to boost the fund balance to $6.5 million during the first three years. So uh, that is some financial good news if it were to come to pass. So we want to talk about some of the issues that have come up. You mentioned that every time you uh, meet with the public, there's a question that comes out of left field that you mm -hmm. haven't uh, exactly uh, anticipated. But I think this one has come up a number of occasions. Um, Pat, one of the issues is, of course, transportation. We know that um, the elementary students in both districts will stay in their home school. Correct. Uh, middle schoolers from Potsdam will then go to Canton, and high schoolers from Canton will come to uh, middle school, Pots or excuse Pots me, school. to the high school over here. Um, transportation costs, of course, are high, but since New York State pays 90% of them, that shouldn't change too much about what uh, happens. But what will change, of course, is time on the bus for those middle school and high school students going in uh, to a different school. Uh, we've seen some letters to the editor that have been very... Um, concerned about time on the bus uh, and how that's going to change. We know that there's bus software that you can actually put in a student's address and the school district they're going to and you can get a good approximation of just how long that bus ride is likely to be. Um, how come we haven't done that yet and given people some hard numbers about what they can expect? We've. Um Bill usually gets a transportation question, <laughs> but I can answer it. I, I, I'm sure he's relieved oh. not to get it this time uh, at the forums. He's, that's usually uh, brings out uh, the more emotional question sure. is on transportation. Sure. How long will my child be on the bus? Will it be longer than before? Um, we uh, knew this was going to be a, a critical issue, and that's why with some of the grant money we received, we did um, – contract with Transportation Advisory Services, a, a pretty well-known company that, that does this type of, of strategizing. And we were, were able to get some numbers of how long students would be on the bus compared to where, where they are now. Uh, we also wanted to, by the configuration, the Joint Advisory Committee and the, and the consultant wanted to minimize the time that the, our youngest children would be on the bus. That's why you see, and partly why you see instead of a pre-K through four, elementary school as we have now in both communities you see a pre-k through five um, so we did if you review the study you do see that there is some information in in there about how long students would be on the bus currently our longest bus rides uh, one way are uh, about 55 minutes 
Um, and that's for those who would be picked up first on a run. So if they're picked up first, they're going to be the last ones off. And it can run anywhere from 10 minutes on a bus to 55 minutes. That doesn't change very much for, it, it, the study showed the longest would be about 60 minutes. Understanding that for most students, pre-K through five, nothing changes. Uh, middle school students in, uh, in Canton, that doesn't change because they're, they're going to be remaining in their community. And high school students in Potsdam, their times don't change. So we're really talking about um, Potsdam middle school students for three years and high school students from Canton for the four years. And we did find that um, in areas like Rensselaer Falls uh, or Morley in Canton or Stockholm here, there will be longer bus rides for some of those students. But the number of students um, is is small compared to the overall, and it's also um, uh, besides the you know the, just the smaller numbers, um, it's we've really found that it's not you know it's not a major issue overall. I mean, it, it, we've we've been upfront that it is going to be longer for some, but when you look at the overall span, it's not. It's it's not. It, it probably to me is the signature uh, issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, that we hear most often. Um, we actually did what, what you suggest be done, and we have a, a software called TransFinder where we actually plugged in the, the addresses of every student in both mm -hmm. districts, and we shared this at the last town hall meeting. We didn't have this backup data to show at the first meeting, so hence some of the letters that you, you right. referenced there. We got into that level of detail, and uh, so what we were able to illustrate is that let's talk about the middle school students that would be coming over to Canton. We're looking at a total of 40 students between our two districts that actually live 15 miles or more, more beyond Canton Middle School. So that would be the population that would spend the longest time on the bus. And as, as Pat indicated, it depends on when the student gets on the bus. So the student that's first on the bus at the outer limits, you know, in the eastern portion, so to speak, of Potsdam coming over to, uh, over to Canton would be uh, 60 to 65 minutes. The closer in that you get when you're picked up would be 25 to 30 minutes. The other thing that uh, happened with the supplementary study that, that we did with transportation was that we adjusted the student populations on the bus. And by that I mean our, our buses are 66 passenger buses. Well, we know that you, you really can't just use that as a number to determine the number of bus routes you need. So what, what happened was that um, we used a number of 45 students um, for the students that live closest to the two villages and the two schools as a planning figure. And then that was reduced by five students for every five mile increment. Yeah. And so when we got out to 20 plus miles, we were talking about using a smaller bus with maybe 15 students on it. So that in the case of Rensselaer Falls, uh, which would have a great distance to travel over to Potsdam High School if we used a smaller bus and did not do with the normal 10, 15, or 20 additional stops that would occur, kind of use an express bus to go over to Potsdam. That would ameliorate uh, some, of, some of the time that's involved in there. And so another thing I don't think the general public is aware of is that we have students right now in Canton and other outlying districts uh, beyond Canton that travel over every day to Potsdam special education <laughs> programs and are on the bus for an hour. And I had a question uh, from one of the members of the public about, well, how long does it take now for the rest of the fall student to come just to Canton? And the answer is about 15 minutes because of all those intermediate right. stops that you have there. <laughs> the other piece of transportation, which is not largely considered by folks, is the fact that we have students that come to our schools and then transload and go over to a program at Seaway Tech with BOCES, and so that piece of it, which is 20 miles essentially for up, for us now moving over there, would be reduced to four or five miles with, with Potsdam being mm -hmm. the high school. Okay, okay. good. Yeah. Well, that, that's, uh, that's new information for a lot of people, yeah. I'm yeah, sure. it is. Pat, I'll direct this question to you. Okay. It's about whether mergers are the right tool. Um, mergers don't solve all the financial and educational problems faced by districts, nor mm -hmm. have they shown themselves to be particularly popular, some facts. 32 school merger studies have taken place in the state over the last decade, just three were approved. Since 2004, two school mergers and one school annexation have been enacted. So my question is, some consider mergers a 1950s tool. Do you think that they're the right tool for the current education funding challenges we're facing, or do we need a bolder vision like maybe countywide school governance? Well, it 
it may be a 1950s tool, it's still a 1950s process, and that's part of the reason why it is a challenge to go through a merger process when you look at uh, the two votes that must occur and how quickly you move from the second vote into setting up a district. And we can talk about that, that process, but it's, it's, it's very, uh, uh, you know, a, a very uh, protracted process. And, um, and, and, you know, it is quite challenging. When we, when the Great Recession occurred in 2008 and districts like Canton and Potsdam started to see significant cuts in funding and we lost 50 jobs in Potsdam, 50 in Canton, um, many programs, we wanted to be ensured that that, that stopped. We, our goal is on the administration, the board, community, we want to provide the best opportunity for our students. And so we looked at a lot of options. And you remember because you were at some of these community uh, forums that we had. And in fact, the idea of merger was one of those that came up out of, in these community forums. We've uh, been look. We have been, besides reductions in in staffing and program, and trying to keep our expenditures in order and advocating at the state level for our fair share of funding. Um, you know, we've we've been going in that direction. We've also looked at shared services. We're sh we're sharing more now through the BOCES and through with other schools than we ever have before. And those those have uh, some of those have come to good fruition to save money, but. Um, you come to a point where if costs are going to continue to go up and you are going to face these gaps every year and you're running out of fund balance, you need another, another tack. Mm -hmm. Mergers, consolidations are, um, are an option. Um, and that's why we went down this road because we really didn't have another $35 million solution to, to the problem in facing both of our schools. Now you asked the question about is, is regional more regional, countywide governance. Governance, yeah. um, you know that that may be the future. It's it's occurred in other places in the country, mm -hmm. um, not so mu not so in New York State. Uh, there needs to be some legislation passed. It's been difficult to get legislation passed at the state level for regional high schools. So we still have a bill that's been languishing for a couple of years in the state legislature, um, and it also takes uh, a much more concerted effort to bring all of these communities on board. The process that, was, that works now is, um, it's, and it's a democratic process, is that each community has to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and that in its, itself is, 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 you know, it's great, it's part of democracy, it's mm -hmm. also a challenge. And we know what we've faced trying to bring two schools together. Um, we know it would be exponentially <laughs> greater trying to bring a lot more schools together and I, I think there will be a time that will come because I do think that the state can't afford 700 school districts. Mm -hmm. And if we have another downturn in the economy um, and schools really, all schools really start to feel this, they will be, ha they'll have to look at such options. May I follow up a little yes. bit? And sure. uh, it's interesting that you referenced that study. That was by the business officials of the state of New York where the 32 schools were examined as to why essentially 29 of, the, of them failed. Mm -hmm. And there were two essential questions. One, are you losing uh, staff and program in the schools? And two, were you fiscally at risk? And it was interesting that the majority of the schools did not have those two considerations, which are both major considerations for us. And in some cases had neither of those. And so I, I could not discern what the impetus was for even going down the road of having the discussion. Another thing that, that uh, some of the districts that entered into the discussions did not do was to do some upfront homework. Um, just by looking at the tax differentials, for example, is one thing that if there's more than a four to five um, dollar differential, it's not going to be feasible. And so in some of those cases, that was the issue as well. It's just you'd be asking to give up your school identities and increase taxes for one or both of the parties. And again, that's just not going to, to um, fly in, in virtually any place. And that actually brings up a good point, Bill, that I'd like to follow up with you on. Uh, we've been a number of conversations here in the last few weeks with people who are running for uh, a seat on the county legislature. And without exception, each one of them has talked about the county budget problems with state mandates, with uh, the lack of funding for some of those mandates, and with the delays in getting a timely payment from the state, even when the state does pay uh, for a mandate. And this is basically the same problem that schools are facing, that you know we, we don't have equitable funding, we don't have uh, 
uh, we, we just simply don't have uh, funding formulas that work equally across the state and certainly are not funding education to the same level that every student in this state is, is getting. Property taxes are always used to make up the difference locally and uh, there's very little evidence that some miracle is going to happen in Albany and all of a sudden that you know is all going to resolve itself. Potsdam and Canton school districts have the exact same tax uh, proper, taxing property problem in that so much of our property in Potsdam and in Canton is not taxable. That means too few people are bearing the burden of making up those differences. Merging these two districts uh, seems like a pretty easy lift when you look at the student populations and you look at the makeup of the community. But we're also merging two districts with the exact same tax, tax problem, which is too few properties. So how, um, you know, how does that actually solve our long-term problem? Is this a short-term solution or is this actually going to fix some kind of a funding problem at the, you know, at the, uh, for, the, for a Berger district that has the same fundamental weakness it had going in? Well, you point, pointed out the inequity that exists mm -hmm. in the system. And so um, if, if you take a look at the amount per pupil that our two districts spend, we're in the eighteen to $19,000 range per pupil. If you compare us to other schools, particularly downstate, we're talking about expenditures in the thirty-six to fifty thousand um, dollars per pupil range. Now, part of that, in all fairness, is because they have that greater tax base. Uh, base. We raise somewhere between eighty-five thousand dollars in Canton. I think it's about about one hundred twenty-five thousand right. dollars in Potsdam for a percent increase in our tax levy. And so when I can raise $170,000 with a 2% tax cap, if that happens to be the actual cap, that doesn't compare to the three quarters of a million dollars per percent mm -hmm. increase down there. So that's part of, the, part of the issue. But that said, those districts are still getting aid from the state of New York when they have the capacity locally to deal with that. We don't have the capacity to deal with, it, with that. And that's one of the reasons Pat and I spent a great deal of time the last couple of years down in Albany asking for that formula to be looked at. So there has to be fundamental change in terms of the funding formula for this to be a long-term solution. In combination with, with this short-term fix, and we're talking seven years according to the study, to at least have a positive fund balance going forward, that allows the time for the other issues to be addressed the as state well. To wake up. After it has to, <laughs> because there are going to be lots of other districts that are finding themselves in this situation so you are, in that time. At frame. this point, you feel like you're that leading that edge. You're leading mm -hmm. that curve, I and that so. when yes. the majority of districts are in the same boat, mm -hmm. then the somebody at, in Albany will pay attention. Mm -hmm. Somebody that matters mm -hmm. in Albany will pay attention, because mm -hmm. we certainly know our local. Legislators are very aware of this, but they and simply they have lobbied are, on yeah, our behalf. Exactly. But it's it's a question of the power block that exists right. downstate uh, in terms us. of yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I have a question, Pat. Uh, a member of the Potsdam community contacted me with a question, and I didn't have the answer. So I'm hoping one of you do. Uh, this person said to me that some central school districts in New York State, like Half Hollow Hills, just as one example, have multiple high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. Uh, her question to me is, why couldn't we just merge in regards to one superintendent, one transportation system, one business office, et cetera, and call that a merger and not have the whole hassle of transportation, which seems to be a, a major concern? What, what's your answer to that? We, as the study went forward, this was a question that we asked as well uh, in terms of if we were to, to um, have a merger, could we keep the two high schools um, and two middle, middle schools, elementary, keep them in place? Because we knew that was going to be a, a, a hot button issue mm -hmm. when, when you're going to have for transportation, for identity issues, many different things like that. Um, the state process there, um, when we spoke to officials at state, um, because they want to see savings and long-term savings, they, they said that that would, would not be feasible. Um, so we couldn't move in the direction. It seems that they, they want to see that there's going, we're going to prepare a situation where there will be economies of scale, uh, where by, for example, moving high schools together, then you could have um, you know, staff you know, look at your long-term staffing and um, you know, uh, 
taking buildings, uh, parts of buildings um, out of commission where you would have some savings um, or partly and possibly rent them out to educational related institutions. So they want to see, they want to see movement of students. They want to see some economies of scale. They want to see some savings. You could, as you say, um, have one facilities director or one superintendent and so forth um, on your own, but you're, one, you're not going to get the merger money. It won't be a merger. Um, okay. It wouldn't as, be called a merger. wouldn't be called a merger. Okay. According to the state. Yes. According to the state. So you're not going to receive the incentive aid uh, to do that. And really, uh, the two purposes, two main purposes for us um, would be to have the, pr the money to sustain and enhance the programs for our students so they're not losing out. Mm -hmm. And secondly is to have long-term, longer-term financial stability. And it's that $35 million incentive aid which will help us to do that. Good. Okay. Donna? You know, um, you mentioned about the um, closing buildings. That's not really on this plan, though, is it? I mean, no, you have, uh, you, you, we've spent a lot of money in both districts renovating and in some cases expanding the facilities in the last few years. Potsdam's just still in the middle of their last renovation project. Is yours done? I know you had one that you were working on uh, earlier. Primarily this, completed. Primarily yes. completed, yeah. completed. So we're not going to see any substantial savings uh, in that because the buildings are all still going to be completely in use. And uh, we know that it costs real money to heat those buildings and mm. maintain them and everything else. So um, that's, that's just a fact of life, isn't it? That we're, that we're not going to save on the building side of things with a merger. Well, yes and no, because the merger would offer the opportunity. As we go forward, there are always building needs. For example, a new auditorium would have to probably be constructed or one significantly expanded. With the merger, the, the merger aid for the next 10 years would be at a 95% level for us, and it, neither of us are at that point right now. Uh, were we to be class reclassified as a high needs district, that would go to 98%. So because we're average needs, it would be 95%. So any additional new construction that we need or renovations going forward, and there's always those challenges that exist. We've already started another list of things that have to be done because it's just like your home. You always have to maintain your, 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 your home and your facilities in this case. And so that's one piece of it. Um, we haven't looked at, right now, probably most of the space is used. It always seems that the activities expand to fit the space that, that is available. Uh, so there would be, as we move forward, we'd have to take a look at where some of the programs would be and if there would be an opportunity to perhaps mothball some portions of the, of the buildings. But when it, when it comes down to it, the facility costs are not something that, that are really extensive in driving the, the yeah. problems that we're, we're talking about in terms of the financial challenges facing us. I think, Ann, that brings up uh, a point that you wanted to raise about enrollment mm -hmm. and talking about, you know, having, yeah. having uh, yeah. lots of space and yet our enrollment's going down. Yeah, yeah. shrinking. Yeah. So that would fulfill what you're saying, which is less space might be needed in the future and you could maybe have other educational uh, institutions use the, that, the extra space. That would be the ideal use, yeah. uh, simply because of security concerns. If we could have that space used for educational purposes, that would make the most sense. You mentioned enrollment. Um, just as a point of order, back in 92, 93, both of our districts or we were above 2,000 students. We had about 1,800. At that point yeah. in time. And so the combined district would be about 2,600 students, which is about 300 students taller than, smaller than the largest district in our area, and that's Messina. And so I, I think folks have lost sight of the fact that we've had pretty, pretty uh, large student population over the time. The other piece of this is we have reached a point where we're, we're level in terms of our employment or uh, enrollment. Mm -hmm. And the study shows that for about the next 10 years, we are going to be fairly steady state going forward with both schools being uh, fairly, fairly fairly comparable in our enrollments, which is a good news story because we can maintain our teaching faculty at that level to support the student programs that we have right now. Right. I have a question then speaking about teaching. Um, financial problems have driven the need to lay off people, unfortunately, uh, cut programs for students and have led you into uh, presenting the public with the notion of a merger. Um, a question then is, do you see uh, student achievement improving as a result of this merger? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the, the, the study shows that there would be opportunities for students um, in a merged district that they don't have now. Um, together, we offer 
this new district would offer about 50 programs that were either offered in one school or the other previously, but now would be offered to all students. Mm -hmm. And these would not just be upper level classes, um, such as AP classes, although those would be expanded. Um, they would also be the music, the arts, the social studies, the sciences. Um, some students, uh, for our, some of our more um, at-risk students who often um, uh, were attracted to family consumer science. Potsdam cut that at their high school. Canton still has that. Mm -hmm. um, the agriculture uh, program, which was largely cut at Potsdam, Canton still has some of, some of those. Strings program that Potsdam has had for years, Canton has not had for over 10 years in music. Uh, those are some of the types of things that, that students would have. Lots mm -hmm. of different um, extracurricular activities as well, which are known to raise um, student achievement. Right. Uh, you know, we've 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 done pretty well overall, our right. students and our staff in in, in student achievement comparatively. Um, I suspect that will continue and and heighten under a, a merged district. That's one of the areas that we are as superintendents trying to provide opportunities for students mm -hmm. that we would get most excited about. And looking at this opportunity would be. Um, what it would do for students. I do not see us being able to sustain our current levels going forward if we were to remain individually or individual schools. Um, Pat, I think, talked about the additive effects of bringing the faculties together, but these are such talented teaching staffs that we have in both schools. I think that there is a synergy that's going to be achieved or would be achieved by this that would, we'd other, otherwise not be able to, to experience. Uh, so I, I, that, that to me is the most exciting prospect about that. It's just the educational programming mm -hmm. that could result from this potential merger. Well, that's exciting. Well, what we want to um, spend just a couple of minutes on in our remaining time is talking about the actual um, mechanics of what's going to be happening here. The straw vote is on Thursday, October uh, 30th from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And the polling site is the Canton uh, High School Library and in the Potsdam uh, high school auditorium, so two places in both communities where folks can go. Um, the proposal, if it passes, the straw vote passes in both communities, then you would take it to a final merger vote, which uh, is set now for December 16th if it's needed. And again, both districts would have to approve that final vote. Um, once that, in the event that that happens, what happens next, Pat? Well, if, uh, if the vote is in favor of merger, uh, as you say, in, in both communities, in both votes. There's, you know, there's really four votes going on right. here, two in each community on October 30th, and then if it gets through there, you know, December 16th. There'll be a lot of work to do, um, a lot of work to do. The first step after that would be to have elections for a new board of education and decide, um, you know, the length of the terms, the number of the board members, and who those board members are. And then you will enter into a major transition period because by July 1st of 2015, there would be an opening of a new school district. So there would be a lot of decisions by the board um, based on the study and based on information that would be provided to them through, you know, through administration. They'd have to select a um, you know, superintendent, mm -hmm. begin a budget process for a merged district, mm -hmm. and begin the process of uh, um, engaging uh, the um, the teachers and the and the um, non-instructional staff administrators for for labor contracts and right. and those that process is, would be, and transportation is six and all of those. a reasonable amount of time <laughs> to do that massive amount of it work. It is a very <laughs> compressed timeline with yes. the number of things that would have to happen. A lot of parallel planning is going on at yeah. this point uh, to to address that to the maximum practical extent. But I just wanted to point out. On the uh, vote on December 16th, there would be two additional questions that would be asked. Um, the, the term length that folks would like mm -hmm. to see in terms of the board members, uh, either three, four, five years, and the number of board members that would comprise the board. They'll have the choice of five, seven, or nine. So that would occur then. And at that point, the district superintendent, Tom Burns, would become involved in the process in, in working with the board right. to, to address many of the issues that Pat raised. Well, gentlemen, I hate to say it, but our time is up, and I think we oh, could fast. easily fill another <laughs> half hour with uh, um, this information, but uh, thank you both very much, not only for coming in today, but for all the work that you have done 
uh, in the last few months, and certainly what about 50 or 60 uh, presentations that you've mm -hmm. made around the two communities. So uh, that is uh, well above what your already exhausting jobs require mm -hmm. of you. So uh, certainly we thank you for that. Uh, these conversations are a production of North Country Matters, which is produced here in the studios of WCKN on the campus of Clarkson University. This show is a civic collaboration between the St. Lawrence County branch of the American Association of University Women, the Communication and Media Department here at Clarkson, and the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters. Until next time, please remember, our North Country Matters.